Good morning, everybody. Um, I am obviously not Steve Colburn. Um, and uh, speaking of Steve, as we begin worship this morning, they are actually starting their sixth. Um, they're actually starting their sixth concert in Poland right now, and so it's going to be really cool that we get to worship simultaneously together. Um, Singing Men of Texas did post that through their first five concerts over in Poland, they've had 532 positive decisions for Jesus Christ. So we are just praising along with Singing Men of Texas as they're over doing a great work in Poland this morning. Um, but when you hand over the service to the youth minister, this is what happens. Um, so we're going to let the shout choir drum for us this morning as we start service, and then we will get ready, uh, and we will jump into worship. So enjoy our shout choir and their awesome drumming skills. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down. goodness. Wow, that's awesome. Well, stand with me and let's uh, begin to worship ourselves this morning as we've been kicked off this morning. Oh, 
sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Uh, we got to hear the percussionist section from the back, and I'm so proud of our shout choir. I know y'all enjoyed that. And if you're here with your child today, welcome to worship. Also, I sure appreciate Tim and our praise team leading us today. Uh, we pray for Brother Steve and our singing men of North Texas as they're in Poland. Um, I'm so excited to begin this service in these baptismal waters. And I just want to remind you of this amazing story. I'm about to baptize the Martin family. Uh, the Martin family um, actually um, got connected to our church through the Good News Clubs. Um, young Easton came to know Christ, and then we saw God begin to work in this family. And today I'm going to baptize two sisters, Shelby and Brooke, and then the father, Joseph, recommitting his life to lead his family for Christ. And then after the Martin family, Hunter Easley will be baptized. It's a great day to be at First Baptist Church. Somebody say amen. 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 Shelby, come in with me. All right, church family, this is Shelby Martin. I'm so proud of her and her decision to follow the Lord. Shelby, I want to begin by asking you several questions. Have you asked Christ to come into your life to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Amen. Is it your desire um, to follow Christ in baptism today as he commanded? Yes, sir. All right, look out at your church and just tell them what you believe about Jesus today. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Based on that testimony of your faith, Shelby, it's my honor and privilege as your brother in Christ and your pastor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Proud of you. All right, Brooke. All right, church family, this is Brooke Guest. And I'm so proud of Brooke as well as a member of this family. Brooke, same questions for you today. Have you asked Christ to come into your life to be Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Amen. Is it your desire to obey Christ's command and be baptized? Yes, sir. Amen. Look at your church family. Tell them what you believe about Jesus today. I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Based on that profession of your faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Proud of you. Joseph. We absolutely love the privilege of baptizing those girls, but I think we all understand when a parent gets baptized, and those girls are right here watching, it's an impactful thing that they will remember for the rest of their life. Church, this is a big deal when we baptize the head of a family. Joseph, I'm super proud and excited for you. Have you asked Christ to come into your life to be Lord and Savior, recommitting your life fully to Him? Yes, sir. Are you ready to be baptized by His command? Absolutely. Good. Tell the church what you believe about Christ today. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Based on that profession of your faith, it's my privilege as your brother and as your pastor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Church family, this is Hunter Easley. Um, I'm super proud of this young man. I, I love him. I'm proud of his decision, the journey that he's been on, where he's leading his family at this time in his life. I know his family is very proud of him. Hunter, I'm excited to stand here with you. Same questions for you. Have you asked Christ to come into your life and be your Lord? Yes. Amen. Are you ready to follow him in baptism today? Yes. Tell your church family what you believe this morning. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Based on that profession, it's my honor as your brother and your pastor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Church family, we're making a mess up here. <laughs> Praise God for that. Uh, we have a member of our missions team um, that's going to be welcoming you today, and I'm trying to see the sign as to who is moving toward the stage. And I'm seeing nobody moving, so it looks like it's going to be me. All right. Um, this morning, we continue in the second week of Mission Fest. We started this last Sunday. And a mission fest is a led effort by our missions committee to see our entire church involved and engaged and participating in missions. So as you leave today, I encourage you with all my heart, go down there and don't just peruse the mission fest, but go sign a sheet and say, hey, I feel God leading me to be involved in this area. Uh, we really want you to do that. I welcome you to worship today. As you can see, we've already had a full plate. From drumming and um, worship and baptism, it's just a great day to be in God's house. We're thrilled that you're here. If you're our guest, do something for me, please. Reach into the pew pocket in front of you. There's a guest card there, all right? Grab one of those, fill it out. There's a giving receptacle out on the landing. We really want you to do that so we can follow up and share more about what God's doing in our church. If you are a smartphone user, just go to our church website, fbccana.org. Click on the guest button, and you can do the same thing there. But let's go ahead and stand at this time. I want you to greet those around you. Find somebody you don't know and hug their neck, shake their hand, say, hey, I'm glad you're in church today. This morning, our risen King.
there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Oh, 
calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God. Fall on my knees and against 
bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Jesus, we are just so thankful for this morning worship. We are so thankful to be here in this beautiful building singing praises, God, that the battle does belong to you. We thank you for Mission Fest, for this emphasis on, on going out and sharing your message, God. Be with Pastor Danny as he brings us the truth of your word this morning, God, and open up our hearts and our minds to the message that you want us to hear. We love you and we praise you. It's in your holy and precious name we all say. Amen. God bless you, church family. Once again, thank you so much for being here this morning. It's always good to come together into God's house and be together. If you are our guest today, please know how much we are um, welcoming you and we're excited that you have joined us. If you're looking for a church home, uh, we pray that you have found one right here at First Baptist Church. Several things before uh, we get into the sermon today. You received, I believe, three sheets when you came in. Not only was there a bulletin or a worship guide for you, there were also several other things and I want to speak about uh, several of those with you. First of all, tonight at 6 p.m., uh, there is an event that's being started and growing out of Corsicana, Texas um, called Take America Back to God. It's a movement that some of our pastors and churches and Christians are beginning right here. Uh, we believe wholeheartedly that the only hope for, the, for our United States is to stand on the solid foundation of God's Word. So I invite you as a member of First Baptist, let's go over to the Lone Star Cowboy Church tonight on Highway 22 and let's be there for this emphasis at 6 p.m. Um, also, I want to let you know that the Good News Cupboard is now open for business. You, you may have heard last Sunday morning uh, just the excitement of our Good News Corsicana campaign. And the Good News Cupboard is that place where you can bring non-perishable items. You can stick them into this pantry. And then hungry people or homeless people, any time of the day, any time of the night, can come there and can get something if they're hungry. It's positioned over on the other side of our Family Life Center. And so we want you to stop off there, put some items in. If you're here this morning and you need food, go check it out. Take, uh, the theme really is this, leave what you can and take what you need. And that's the way it's going to be set up. So don't forget the new, good news cupboard. And then finally, that third sheet that you received today is a reminder that April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Obviously, we as God's people uh, believe that every child should be safe. We believe in firm biblical discipline, no doubt. However, we want families to be guided by truth. We want to stand for the protection of children. So I just remind you of that today as well. Uh, let's go ahead and begin this morning's message. And to do that, I want to introduce you to an evangelist named Jay Strack. If you've never heard of Jay Strack, he was one of the leading evangelists for generation um, in the United States. And a story about his life is that Jay Strack went to the Holy Land nine times in his life. And on every one of those visits, he asked for and he received the same Bedouin tour guide. And on each of those tours, he witnessed to that same guide over and over again because he wanted to tell him about Jesus Christ. And on one, on one occasion, this guide asked Jay Strack, Hey, why do you keep telling me about Jesus? I don't quite understand. And Jay Strack was talking to him about the importance of Jesus Christ in his life. And at that point, this Bedouin tour guide said this. He said, Oh, I think I understand now. He said, You don't want to commit the sin of the desert. Well, Jay wasn't familiar with that particular phrase, so the man explained it this way. He said to Bedouins or to nomadic people, the ultimate sin is the sin of the desert, knowing where water is but refusing to tell others its location. Well, today I want to use that term as we begin this message, and here's what I want to say, that the sin of the desert just might be the greatest sin in the church today. And the reason is because if we know Jesus Christ, and we're not telling others who need to know Jesus Christ, then we are committing the greatest sin of all sins. You see, the sin of the desert reminds us that evangelism is the most important thing in the church today. It's not optional for God's people. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've made the decision we saw these make in this baptistry today, then you are obligated, you should be obsessed with the truth that you must be sharing your faith with those who don't know Jesus Christ. So this morning as we move into this second Sunday of Mission Fest, I want to ask some very specific questions, and I think these will speak directly to your heart. And here, here's where it is. How do we do missions effectively? 
Uh, you may have wondered, how do I lead somebody to faith in Jesus Christ? How can I evangelize successfully? How can I reach somebody for the Lord? How can we successfully right, bring in the harvest? Well, if that's your question today, then the only place that we have to go is to Jesus Christ, the master evangelist. So as we kick off today, I want to go to a story that involves Jesus and a woman at the well found in John chapter 4. Go ahead and take your Bibles, if you would, and begin turning there. We're going to um, begin in, in John chapter 4, verse 29. And as you're going to verse 29, I want to tell you really the lead up to this story, the heart of this story. That Jesus is in the region of Judea, the Bible tells us, and he's going to make his way to Galilee. And the reason I, I use this, this um, gesture today is because that was a northern journey. To go from Judea to Galilee meant that he had to go through a region called Samaria. And in Samaria, there were people called Samaritans. And Jesus finds himself in the town of Sychar. And there in Sychar was a very famous biblical location, Jacob's Well. How many of you have ever heard of Jacob's Well? Very important in the Old Testament. So Jesus makes his way there to rest, to get some refreshment and some water, and he sends his disciples into town to buy some food. Well, while Christ is there drinking and resting, this woman comes to the well, and Jesus engages her in conversation. And the conversation goes something like this. They were talking about quenching their physical thirst with the water from the well, and then Jesus said, however, there's a different kind of water. There's living water that can quench a person's spiritual thirst. The woman says, hey, if you've got that water, I would like that because I don't, will no longer have to come to the well again. And through this extended conversation, he reveals to her that he is the promised Messiah. Well, right before she scampers off to go tell the village, the disciples come back and they are stunned to see Jesus talking to a woman. Let me backtrack a little bit. You see, in the New Testament society, there was no way that a man was supposed to be talking to a strange woman in such ways. In addition, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Why would they hate these people? Because they were, and let me say it bluntly, they were half-breeds. Their father or their mother was a Gentile. The other was a Jew. These were a mixed race, if you will, and the Jews hated them for that reason. They despised them. They rejected them. They steered clear of them, yet Jesus makes his way through, and he even talks to a woman there. The disciples are stunned, but then the woman scurries off to tell her whole town that she met Jesus, who is called the Christ. And that's where we pick up the story today in verse 29. Let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's word today. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 29. And I'll be reading, as always, from the New International Version this morning. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, let me just say this to you. There's one in the pew pocket in front of you. If you don't have a Bible at home, take that home. It's our gift to you. We want you to have it, all right? We want you to have a copy of God's word. So let's pick up the story in verse 29. This is the woman speaking. Come see a man, she said, who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? That word means the Messiah. And they came out of the town and they made their way toward Jesus. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. 
They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. May God bless the reading of his word today. May we be inspired to missions as we study this passage. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, folks, this entire experience, this entire passage, this entire story, it reveals to us the secret of how to be successful as an evangelist. If you want to lead somebody to faith in Jesus Christ, you ought to set up on the edge of your seat today because this passage gives the secret how to do it. And here are the three things you need to know. First, we must see the masses. Second, we must seize the moment. And third, we must share the message. And those are the three key words in the message today. See and seize and share. Let's talk about those one at a time. First, we must see the masses. And I get that truth from verse 35. When the disciples return from town, when they come back to Jesus at the well, he says, open your eyes and look. Now, why did Jesus say that? Well, apparently the disciples had not been looking. They had been to town to buy food, but they hadn't witnessed to a single person. They had missed a really significant missions opportunity. And the question is, why had they missed it? Well, the answer is simple. First, because of preoccupation, and second, because of prejudice. Now, let's talk about preoccupation. When the disciples went into town that day, they were so preoccupied with their own needs, they didn't think about anyone else. They had been so interested in getting physical food, they had forgotten to share the very bread of life. In other words, they had missed their opportunity. They were preoccupied. But in addition to that, as serious as that first one, is prejudice. They had also missed their opportunity because of prejudice. Now, I mentioned to you earlier the Jews despised the Samaritans. In other words, the Samaritans weren't their kind of people. They were a different race a different religion, a different culture. And these Jewish men never even considered that this whole city might be ready to receive Jesus Christ. But, but before we're too hard on them and before we judge them for their actions, let's hold a mirror up to ourselves. You know what your greatest danger is in sharing the gospel? Probably the same two things. Let's start off with preoccupation. I think preoccupation is the greatest danger in the church today. It's the greatest danger to you as a Christian. Why? Because you can become so wrapped up in living. You can become so wrapped up in running your business. You can become so wrapped up in raising your children, so wrapped up in building your home, so wrapped up in planning your vacation, so wrapped up in even pastoring the church that you miss out on eternal things in life. You become so focused on the physical that you forget all about the spiritual. And I have an example, and it's hard for me to share it, that, that really exemplifies this, this very thing. When I was in college, I had several different roommates. And one of those roommates was very dear to me. He was a solid Christian. He was a ministerial student. He was a missionary early in his young adult life. But I saw him several years ago, and he said this to me. I asked him about his ministry. And he said, Danny, well, I don't do that anymore. I'm entangled. And I said, what do you mean entangled? He said, well, my new family and my job keep me from the ministry that I used to have. So what was my former roommate entangled in? He was entangled in life, the thorns of life, the preoccupation with life. You see, today I stand here to tell you that the same thing can happen to any of us. We can become preoccupied with the things that we do and forget about the things that God needs us to do. So beware of preoccupation. But now let's, let's turn it over. What about prejudice? Is that an issue for us? In the year 2023, the disciples were so blinded by their prejudice toward the Samaritans that they... They didn't even know they needed to share with them. And, and, and I, I'm going to share with you a quote now from Larry McSwain that speaks about this. He's the former provost of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And here's what he said. He said, we Baptists are missing the folks who are smarter and richer than we are. 
but we're also missing the folks that are dumber and poorer than we are. And I want to add to his statement, I think we're also missing those who are, for the most part, just different than us. But Jesus tells us that we're not supposed to miss any person, whether they're like us or whether they're near us, whether they're not like us or whether they're not near us. That's the message from last Sunday morning. The Great Commission says, go and make disciples of whom? Say it with me. All nations. Now, what's the word nations mean? The Greek word nations literally means, it's the, it's the word ethnos. It's where we get our word ethnic, and it literally means every race, every tribe, every culture, every continent. Folks, it's time for us to see all people. It's time for us to see the masses. It's time for us to have the same passion as Mahatma Gandhi had, and I quote, here's what he said, the passion of my life is the last and the least and the lowest and the lost. Friends, that has to be the passion of First Baptist Church. We must see the masses for Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. See the masses. Now let's move to the second thing. See the masses and now seize the moment. Go back to verse 35. Look at Christ's words. Do not say four months more and then the harvest. I say the fields are already ripe for harvest. Now this is going to make a lot of sense to you ag people. And I know when I preach in Navarro County, there's always a chance I'm speaking to somebody who is an agricultural person. And if you're an agricultural person, you know that the harvest is a seasonal thing. But you also know that that seasonal timing of the harvest, well, it soon passes because there are three stages, right, of a crop's growth and harvest. First, green. Second, ripe. Third, rotten. And that's the way it goes. And because it's that way, the harvest is effective in only one stage. Not when it's green, not when it's rotten, but when it's ripe. And that's what Christ is talking about. But he's not speaking about plants. He's talking about the harvest of a person's soul. He was saying that when the spiritual harvest is ready to be gathered in, that God's people, the church, Christians, we have to be ready right now. Urgency is essential. Let me tell you the story. In 1989, one of the best movies, I believe, of all time came out called The Dead Poets Society. And the Dead Poets Society is a movie, if you've seen that, you know it stars Robin Williams. And he plays the role of a teacher named John Keating. And in John Keating's first class of the entire semester at this wealthy boys' school, he takes the boys into a hall to stare into this trophy case. And inside that trophy case are all of these pictures of heroes of the past history of the school. And he tells the boys to come in close. And he says, boys, all these young men are as you were as you are today. They started life with great promise. And all of you someday will be as they are now. You see, they're all dead, and so will you be. He said, so what do you think they would say to you today? And then he says, come in closer. And he has them come in really close and put their ear even up to the glass. And then in this whispery, raspy voice... He says, carpe diem, carpe diem, carpe diem, seize the day. And I've thought about that for the church. And I've thought about how appropriate that phrase, seize the day, is for you and I as the followers of Jesus. You see, that's the message of this passage that we have to seize this day. We have to seize every moment that God is giving to us. You see, every indication in our world is that people need to hear the gospel. They're hungering for truth. They're hungering to eat of the living bread of Jesus. They're hungry to drink of the living water of Jesus Christ. However, the problem is that too many churches are playing hide and seek in the county seat. They're not focused on evangelism. They're just focused on growing themselves and becoming more obese in their, in their religiosity. But, but God calls us not to sit and soak 
and sour until the second coming, but he calls us to go and win the lost of faith in Jesus Christ. You see, he wants us to see the people and then he wants us to seize the moment. And I need to remind you of this today, that a church that is not seeking the lost is lost. A church that is not seeking the lost is lost. So we have to see the masses. We have to seize this moment because the field is ripe unto harvest. Somebody say amen again. See the people. Seize the moment. The last secret to effective evangelism, share the message. Share the message. Now I want to focus on the end of this entire experience in verse 39. And then I want you to see verse 41. Let's look at these together. It says, Many of the Samaritans of that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony, because of the woman's words. And then verse 41 says, And many more believed because of Jesus' words. Now what I want, don't want you to miss this morning is the emphasis on words, her words and Jesus' words. Human words and divine words, the word of a witness and the word of God. Sooner or later, you see, all evangelism, it comes down to what? It comes down to words. Somebody has to say it. Somebody has to testify as to what God has done. Somebody has to tell others what they've experienced in Jesus, sharing words. Here's the secret, is the secret. Sharing words is the secret to the entire harvest. And as simple as that sounds... That's our problem. That's the problem in the church. Many of us are not ready to speak words to others about Christ. And as a pastor, I've heard this. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times. They'll say something like this. Well, the best way I can be a witness pastor is to just go live my faith. And yeah, sometimes actions speak louder than words. But I want to tell you it takes more than actions. Somebody has to have the guts to bear witness. Somebody has to have the courage to speak words for Jesus Christ. I love the testimony of Keith Parks. He, he was a grand name in Baptist life. He was a leader in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. He was the former president of the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. And here's what he said. As far as I know, we're never told in the Scripture that we should prepare the hearts of the people. That's God's business. What we are told to do is to busy ourselves at sowing and reaping, and that involves telling others. You see, Keith Parks is right. So now everybody look at me. Have you told others? Have you shared words for Jesus Christ? Are you telling others? Have you shared the message of the good news of your Lord? Have you even tried to lead one person to faith in Jesus. You see, when you ask questions like that, you recognize it is time to see the people, to seize the moment, and to share the message. This has been a very big weekend in our community. And I don't know if you got to enjoy the Texas Veterans Parade yesterday, but it was really wonderful for us and our patriotism to be able to shake the hand and pat the back of many of our veterans. And if you're a veteran here today, you hear this from me. Your pastor appreciates what you've done for me. Our country loves you. And I, and I share that because I want to end with a very important moment in American history. And the truth is, it was probably one of the most notable moments in the history of the world. It was June the 6th, 1944. On June the 6th, 1944, the high command of the Allied forces under the Supreme Commander Dwight David Eisenhower, they were all gathered in Portsmouth, England. And they were poised for what was going to be called Operation Overlord, the cross-channeled attack from England into France. It was going to be called D-Day. It was the invasion of Normandy. Really, if it was successful, it would be the end of the Second World War. And I've always been... I've always marveled at the expansive nature of this invasion. Listen to these numbers. The U.S., Great Britain, and Canada had, had assembled the largest amphibious assault force in history. It involved 3 million men, 5,000 large ships, 4,000 small landing craft, and more than 11,000 aircraft. 
It was the greatest invasion fleet ever to sail the seas. And as I said earlier, if it was successful, it was going to be the beginning of the end of World War II. Well, if you know history, you know that invasion was set for June the 5th. But bad weather had caused the launch to be delayed by at least 24 hours. And as General Eisenhower met with his chiefs of staff, all their eyes turned to one man, history tells us. His name was J.M. Stagg. He was the chief meteorologist of the whole operation. And General Eisenhower asked that day, Mr. Stagg, could you give me an update on the weather? And Mr. Stagg said, yes, sir. A fresh weather front could provide hope of improved conditions tomorrow. He said, we'll have a corridor of about 36 hours where the ceiling will be about 3,000 feet. If we wait beyond that, it will be at least a month before the weather will allow us to go. Eisenhower turned to all of his commanders, and he asked each one how they felt. But he knew ultimately the decision was his. So after listening, history says he sat there about 30, 40 seconds in silence looking down at his papers, contemplating. And then he raised his eyes and his head, and he looked at his fellow commanders, and he said the consequences of delay justify great risk. He said, we go. We go. Now, church, our decision as Christians, our decision to go, it affects more than the outcome of a war in time. You see, our decision to go doesn't affect just tomorrow. Our decision to go and share the gospel in the name of Jesus is for people for all eternity. We're sowing and reaping for everlasting life. And so I ask, how many hours do we have before the ceiling falls? How many hours and days do we have before the sun truly sets? I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you this. It's getting awfully dark outside. You see, God knows, and he knows we've had enough time already. So the time has come for the church to say, just like Eisenhower said, the consequences of delay justify great risk eternally. So we go now. I'm asking you, will you go? Will you see people? Will you seize the moment God's giving? Will you share the message? Jesus said the field is ripe unto harvest now. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Almighty God, this is a, a great challenge to us. And we're so thankful that we can look back into this story of the woman at the well. And we can identify the secret to leading people to you is to see them to take the opportunity and to just share the message. God, my prayer is that you would raise us up as a church, but that you would raise up every individual in this room to know that we have an opportunity. And God, I'm going to pray today that you would give us an opportunity. Give us an opportunity with a neighbor that lives right next door. Give us an opportunity with a coworker that sits at the desk right behind us. Give us an opportunity, Lord Jesus, with, with a classmate at school who we see every day in the hall. And God, when you give us that opportunity, help us to be filled with your spirit, to have the courage and the guts to say, hey, I want to tell you the most important thing in life and eternity. I want to tell you about my Jesus. Jesus, give us those chances. And come in and fill us with words to say. God, remind us that you fill us with those words. We don't have to come up with it. That you'll do it through us. Lord, take our church from being attenders to being missionaries. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.